My dear brothers and sisters, thank you for your participation with us on this special occasion. I regret that I cannot be with you in person, but I am grateful for the technology that allows me to speak with you now from church headquarters. We have been giving much prayerful thought to the hardy pioneers who labored and sacrificed to make it possible for faithful members of the church to receive their blessings in the Manti, Utah Temple. Over time, countless craftsmen, artists, and laborers have created this unique treasure. We have also given prayerful foresight to the growing number of faithful members of the Church who now live or will yet live in this central sector of Utah. In addition, we have considered the thousands of students who come to Snow College in pursuit of their education. We care about their well-being and their future. In the April 2019 General Conference, we announced that the Manti Utah Temple would need renovation. This pioneer temple needs mechanical upgrades and other changes to keep it useful and safe. It also needs to be revised to offer the revealed ordinances and covenants to members who speak languages other than English. That will be made possible by filmed presentations, as in other temples. To begin this multi-year project, we will close the Manti Utah Temple around next October 1st. We have continued to seek the direction of the Lord on this matter. We have been impressed to modify our earlier plans for the Manti Utah Temple so that the pioneer craftsmanship, artwork, and character will be preserved, including the painted murals loved by so many. We will leave those murals where they are located now, inside the Manti Utah Temple. Now, may we turn our attention to Manti's neighboring city, Ephraim. After much study and prayer, and with our deep gratitude for the Lord's respondings to our pleadings, I am pleased to announce that we have been impressed to build a new temple in Ephraim, Utah. These decisions will expand future opportunities for members in this temple district to participate in sacred temple ordinances and, at the same time, allow us to preserve the unique classical character and useful life of the historic Manta Utah Temple. As you can imagine, many details remain for later decisions. I have asked selected church leaders to meet with you today to respond to any questions you may have. I am most grateful for their help. Now, on behalf of the First Presidency, may I take this opportunity to thank all of you for your faithful devotion to the work of the Lord. You comprise a stalwart part of the Lord's vineyard. I express my love for you and my testimony that we are engaged in the work of Almighty God. Jesus is the Christ. This is His Church. We are His servants. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thy hands have made. 
some degree of being left out in life and uh, that's all any of us want is to be included. If I were talking to someone who, who was feeling excluded or was being excluded, I would say, look, this isn't about you. This is blindness or just at the very least a lack of kindness and consideration on the part of others who are probably self-consumed, as most of us are. So you continue, you remember who you are. Above all else, we have to constantly remind ourselves that we are cherished children of a Father in heaven who loves us. If we're impatient with someone who doesn't seem to be progressing as fast as we think they might, I think it's always good to look at our own journey and see how fast we're progressing either now or were at some point. And if I, if I have those thoughts, it's an instant check to, to prevent me from feeling that way about someone else. Largely because I realize how extraordinarily patient our Father in Heaven is with, with me and with all of us. One of the great lessons of the Gospel is that we get so many fresh starts that we can start again and again, that we can fall, that we can stumble, that we can pick ourselves up, and that we get a fresh start. You know, there's so much in daily life that doesn't suggest that at all. And um, this, this is a place that we get to begin again and begin again and again. I think we lose sight of that. And I think that's so encouraging for, for people who, who might get down on themselves. I know a lot of people grow up in the church and it can be cultural. Um, it can be just what we do. 
others will say, well, why the church? And I had an experience. I suppose it's about 15 years ago. I came from our home in England to General Conference. And I was coming out of a session surrounded by people from all over the world. And I thought, this is it. This is the church. We're from everywhere. We include everybody. And this is where I belong. And it was a wonderful feeling. I think whether you're coming into it for the first time or if you've been here for generations, um, we have to remember and constantly remind ourselves that as someone wise once said, this is a hospital for the sick, not a monastery for the perfect. There is nobody perfect here. We're not going to find them. It isn't going to be you. We're here because we all need help from one another. Some of us are helped more for a season by helping others. Others need help for a while. And at different points, we're both of those. But we're here to help each other, and it serves us well to remember that. When you get an impression, act upon it, however uh, unusual it seems or however inadequate you feel in following it. Over 50 years ago, I was serving as a counselor in the Chicago South Stake Presidency. I had received an invitation to be the sacrament speaker in the evening uh, in one of our Far West units near Aurora, Illinois. This was about a one-hour drive from my home. When I received an invitation to speak, I had usually gotten impressions about what I should speak about. On the occasion of my invitation to speak in Aurora, I didn't have any impression. I left and pondered as I drove. What will I speak? I was halfway to Aurora before I got an impression, but I followed the impression I had received to speak about things I had observed in the Chicago criminal courts. And I spoke of young people who were brought into court for, for thievery of various kinds, including shoplifting. And I talked about how serious this kind of crime was and how effective the storekeepers with the aid of the police were in apprehending young offenders and what happened to them when they were found guilty of such offenses. As I concluded my talk, a mother came up to me tearfully thanking me for my talk. She told me that she had a young son who had been involved in shoplifting. This mother said, when I learned that you were going to speak this evening, and when I knew about your background, I prayed to the Lord that you would say something that would help our son. You did, she said. He listened to you in a way he has never listened to us. And I thank you for hearing the Spirit of the Lord and, and following it. When you get an impression, act upon it, however uh, unusual it seems or however inadequate you feel in following it, act upon it. There's a reason. You may not know the reason, but blessings will follow to you and someone else if you hear him. Impact. What comes to mind when you hear that word? Is there a visual that you see, a moment you've experienced yourself? Is it an emotion? Does it immediately meet you where you are or does it gradually rise and crash into you? Is it something you did to someone or that you did to yourself? Did the impact happen to you?
When you look up the word impact, it can be either positive or negative. The definitions are the action of one object coming forcibly into contact with another, or have a strong effect on someone or something. The first impact that I can remember on my life was in fifth grade, and I was an only child. My mom and my dad were these unique pillars that held me up. My dad was this sturdy oak tree of a man, very rooted in family, and to me, the best playmate. My mom, she was like this steady sun. She's constant and joyful. She made every day brighter and showed me how to dream. She believed I could do anything. These two pillars were like the bumpers to my life. Any impact that I came into, they guarded me, they protected me, and helped me bounce back, and I thought nothing could break us. Until they told me they were getting a divorce. My character, perspective on who I was, who my parents were to me, and what life now looked like shifted. This moment was a forceful impact. Have you ever questioned who you are? What is your value? And what's your purpose? Those questions came to me in fifth grade as a result of this force. I didn't learn how I moved through this until I was 28 years old. So fast forward to my late 20s. I'm living in New York City. I'm an entrepreneur who did digital marketing for small businesses and startups. And one day at a co-working space on 28th and Park Avenue, a young lady walks up to me and says, you have the perfect body type for skeleton. I'm completely confused, thinking, is this an insult or a new way of making friends I hadn't heard of yet? I ask her, what is skeleton? She tells me that it's the winter Olympic sport where you go face first down the bobsled track at 80 to 90 miles per hour. She currently was training for the Winter Olympics in Peocheng, South Korea. She told me that I could attend a combine, which is a fitness test, to try out. Now, let me give you some background. I ran track, played lacrosse, and cheered in high school, and then I played collegiate lacrosse, but I had never even recreationally done a winter sport in my life. <laughs> I grew up in Texas, I'm half Nigerian, I hardly handle the cold at all. But there was this small voice inside me that said, look it up and go. So I did. I currently train for the skeleton and it has been one of the most fulfilling experiences I've ever done. But as you can imagine, there's a lot of pain in trying and practicing and competing in this sport. There's an ice wall that feels like cement and when you hit it, because you will hit it, the only thing between you and that wall is a thin spandex suit, which my niece likes to remind me, looks like I'm competing in my cool onesie pajamas. And as all athletes know, there is a mental trick to embracing the hit. My coach told me, when you see yourself coming into a curve at the wrong angle and you find yourself in a bad position to relax, to sink into your sled, and embrace the hit. When you try to avoid or steer away from the wall, you actually drive yourself into it even harder and it keeps you on the wall for longer. But if you embrace the hit, it can redirect you and put you on a smoother, straighter line and sometimes set you up for a better result in the end. He taught me how to use the mistake. Imagine that for a minute. When you find yourself in a difficult position or endure hardship, a loss, a divorce, failure or a letdown, you can be redirected to a better outcome if you choose to listen and embrace the hit. When I found myself trying to navigate my parents' divorce, their remarriage, the four step siblings I gained, I didn't know I was going and doing this example of embracing the hit. I found myself praying more often when I felt angry or confused. I turned to my Heavenly Father and He showed me another way to give Him the burden and show love to others, not dwell in pain or steer away from the unfamiliar. He said, let's use this to learn who I've made you to be. This impact refined me. It chiseled me out. And now I can see the perspective of what family can look like. What I didn't tell you is that I'm also adopted. I have birth parents, adoptive parents, and step parents, and with all six lines, I am one of nine siblings. My family members and I have had to build these relationships. But when you step back to ask and see the Lord's hand in your life, He will show you. Who am I? I am His daughter, the daughter of Heavenly Father, who met me where I was and offered me His love. 
the same love he has for each of his children. So why am I here? We all needed one another, my family members and me, and I was blessed to be in a position to have a family grow out of a difficult time, but only because of him, who is aware of each of us so precisely. Some hits you see coming, some you're blindsided, and I had an impact this past Christmas that I never saw coming. The wake of it was more profound than any I could have imagined. My husband and I moved to another state because of the global pandemic. We were blessed to move closer to family. When we arrived during Thanksgiving, we found out that we were pregnant. It was fantastic news, and we could not have been more surprised and excited. We were planning to tell our families over Christmas and share this positive impact that was growing. Unfortunately, two days before Christmas, I began to have cramping and experiencing some bleeding, and within a few hours, we learned I was having a miscarriage. This collision was beyond a forcible wave that crashes over you. It felt like I was paddling in the deepest ocean and I was slowly drowning. And during those weeks, I felt the impact of how much hope can hurt. It can be exhausting to want something good and not know why. It can't be what you know or what you thought it should be right now. But as I learned, listen and embrace the hit. I found myself on my knees praying, almost wrestling with Heavenly Father to help me. And it wasn't till weeks later that a phrase began to repeat in my mind, that all these things shall give thee experience. I gained a measure of empathy for parents and motherhood. I was taught that his timing is so perfect that it's unimaginable. Women began sharing with me their losses and their joys. I heard experiences of miracles, transformations, and I found myself loving others, complete strangers, with such a fondness that I hadn't known. Something that my coach didn't teach me, but that my savior did, was the more demanding the trial, the larger your capacity grows in the opposite direction, for joy. I didn't know that I could be happier because I had felt such pain, but I knew it was the darkest I had ever felt and I see how he has lifted me and made my burdens light so that I may live after the manner of happiness. Patience is merely utilizing the time to learn what he needs you to know so you can bless others. The action of embracing is rooted in hope, hope through progression. Heavenly Father has been teaching me through the Holy Ghost why trials are essential Jesus Christ suffered all our trials, heartache, and felt that we have and will feel in our darkest moments when he made the ultimate atoning sacrifice for our sins. Without the darkest moment of my life, I could not have experienced how sweet the brightest moments are. People ask me, like maybe you've been asked, how did you get through it? Or how are you? I like to reply with, I chose to ask to see the Lord's hand in my life. He will show you, maybe not in the timing you want, but I assure you that he is aware of you and wants you to see his path and his plan. So listen and embrace the hit. This is a global work. And whenever I'm comfortably situated in my home, I'm in the wrong place. I need to be where the people are. Since January 2018, when he became president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, President Russell M. Nelson, my husband, is more future-oriented than ever. During his first two years, he traveled over 115,000 miles to 35 nations on six continents. 
and during the year 2020, when travel was not possible because of the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic, technology allowed President Nelson to continue his reach around the globe, bringing compassion and eternal truths to 16 million church members and to millions of their friends. President Nelson has issued historic invitations, inviting all to find and stay on the covenant path, to give thanks, and to let God prevail. He has built bridges of understanding when meeting with world religious and government leaders and in meetings with members in large and small settings. Through it all, President Russell M. Nelson is giving his all to minister in a higher and holier way. And he continues to believe that the best is yet to come. What has caught my attention is he doesn't just want to bring the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. He wants to bring the blessings of the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And he would like to bring the blessings to every single person himself. <laughs> so that's what we have there with President Russell M. Nelson. He knows that the Lord has something for every country that will make it better, for every family that will make them stronger, for every individual that may, will make them happier. So he is compelled to do that. He can't restrain himself. He is uniquely uh, fit and uh, lively, uh, and I think he just made the decision, we're gonna go. And the people responded. It was faith promoting for me, and surely, surely was faith promoting uh, for the people who experienced it. I think it was faith promoting for President Nelson. He's gonna go to all of the world. He's gonna make more of these trips. To be with President Nelson is, it's like being with an old friend. I mean, he's so genuinely engaging. It's like he could be your grandfather and, or your father. You could just... You just talk to him. Just talk to him. <laughs> and he very much reaches out to people, which is, I think, you know, just disarming that he makes you feel so comfortable. The people, they welcome you in ways that you've never been welcomed before. They're saying, President Nelson, we welcome you home. I know some of them, I know their parents, and I know their grandparents. They feel like I'm part of the family. <laughs> And I do, I mean, I love these people. Families lined up on both sides of the street, waving and with posters and ribbons and banners. President Nelson would reach out and Sister Nelson would reach out of the window and wave to them. You could see the squeals of delight. It was such a tender, human tie that the Lord's prophet was waving to them and reaching to them and pointing to them. Hi, President. Hi, President. Hi, hi Nelson. <laughs> it was really quite a thrill. To see the faithful members who come early, they sit, they wait. <laughs> They're showing such respect for the prophet and the Lord. Those dignified Tongan saints, they were there in the rain for two hours waiting to see the prophet and hear what he had to say to them. And that was just lovely. We love it when in these uh, venues where he said, is it all right if I speak with you in Spanish? And these huge smiles and then leaning forward in their seats and then just completely absorbed it. That has they been incredible. They blossom. <laughs> they just blossom. Con su permiso, quisiera hablar en español. Uy, todos se asombraron. Creo que nadie imaginó que iba a hablar en español. Pero sí, fue algo muy especial. Como que, wow, el profeta habla en nuestro idioma. There is something very personal about uh, seeing the prophet and having him speak in your own country. And I think when he's there, and when they come prepared, the Holy Ghost helps them to have something very special happen with them. And uh, when that happens, what could be more precious than that, to have a witness from the Spirit that this is the Lord's prophet. That's very special. 
I think it's a sign of how much he loves the members in this International Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He wants to be with them, travel to them, see them the way he has. Beautiful example. Everything we do, it is all about the Lord. It's always about where does the Lord need us to go? What does the Lord need us to do when we travel? I think of a statement by President Kimball. I should come and see this country sometime when I come back. You know, the, yes. <laughs> it's not about sightseeing, it is about saintseeing. We have to realize that these are not generally Christian countries and they don't know what we're talking about when we say that God lives because they don't know God and they don't know Jesus Christ. And these dear souls who are searching for happiness, searching for joy, searching for meaning in life, don't know where to turn. And so our responsibility is to teach and to testify that God lives, Jesus is the Christ. And that he's not dead, he's not an icon on the cross. He's a resurrected Lord and he directs the work of his church. This is a faithful evening, and I have been assigned the task to introduce and present a brother of another mother, a different faith tradition, and of a different race. Hi, Mr. President. Yes. Hello, Amos. Good to see you again. How are you, dear friend? I'm doing fine. Good, good. I'd like you to meet my wife, Wendy. Oh, indeed. Hey, nice How are to you? Meet you. We had a most cordial, unforgettable experience with His Holiness. He was most gracious and warm and welcoming to President Ballard and me. I told him we were going to meet with hundreds of his Italian youth tonight. He said, you teach them to love their grandparents. <laughs> the moment when President Nelson actually embraced the Pope as we left was everything. I do believe that when you see the prophet in person, you feel something, his personalization, talking about their families, and then talking about the families in their country, and then talking about the poor and the needy and those who need humanitarian care. And they leave having felt like they were with a prophet. Our time together was marked by a feeling of mutual respect and a desire to link arms to see if we could capitalize on our respective strengths and help more people by working together. Simply stated, we strive to build bridges of cooperation rather than walls of segregation. President Nelson is a leader. He brings the love of God. He says strong families make strong communities. Strong communities make strong countries. Well, I've seen more perfectly how it's done or how it's done more perfectly. The president uh, has a gift for that, and I think all of us can cultivate that gift of caring and of uh, pure love of Christ in our lives. And I think that's what I want to have in my life is a, is a constant caring, a consistent way of ministering. Well, we don't look alike, but the things that we have in common are much more important than the differences that we may have. So. Wherever the people are, they're God's children, and they're our brothers and sisters, regardless of nationality, race, color. When I learned more about President Nelson's background, I saw some incredible similarities. Our things in San Francisco. And then our two national hymns, Lift Your Voice and Sing, and Come, Come, You Saint. These two songs, about a people who, in spite of being oppressed, excelled. And I had a wild moment when I reflected on the fact 
and Mr. Clayton wrote Come, Come, You Saints, which tells the story of the struggles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in that song, they didn't get bitter. They became better and they endured. And they sang, come, come, ye saints. No toil or labor fear. And I love that phrase that says, great shall be as your day. So gird up your lawns, fresh courage take. Our God will never us forsake. And soon we'll have this tale to tell. All is well, all is well. It can be well in this nation when we lock arms, as I locked arms with President Nelson, not as black and white, not as Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, or Baptists, but as children of God who are about loving everybody and bringing hope, happiness, and good health to all of God's children. Young people come by the hundreds to these meetings, take notes, and they'll have better lives because of it. They're just so spectacular. When we've met with these smaller groups of youth, they are absolutely anchored. They're doing it. They're, they're having family home evening. They're in the scriptures. They're receiving their patriarchal blessings and finding great joy. It's incredible to see people from different places but with the same religion, you will feel connected. And it's incredible that the principle of our church is love everyone because Heavenly Father loves everyone. And that's the thing that affected me the most, that, that make me want to stay in church, stay with this big, great family. I feel that the church is, is a safe haven and that around us are a lot of people who don't believe in God and they don't have that common belief for that. And, as I come to church, I'm able to interact with people who have that common belief and we're able to strengthen each other. Seeing the different cultures come together, you see that love that each and every one of us have and that we have that common theme that we're children of our Heavenly Father and that we're followers of Jesus Christ. Hi, how are you? <laughs> how are you doing? I love you. My parents. So. Okay, you kids all go to the meeting. Huh? <laughs> I think it was a particularly significant message at this point to have the president of the church come see a relatively small group and by his presence say, you matter. You're in our hearts, you're in our minds, in our prayers. The Lord is mindful of you and we're mindful of you. These youth are hungry for the words of the Lord. They're lifting themselves up above the mediocrity. It was a real thrill to be with them. I tried to look in their eyes and see what their mothers were like, <laughs> what their fathers were like. His personalization uh, and connecting with them I wish that you could be sitting where I am and see all the faces of, they light up like uh, like Christmas trees, you know what he says that. And then they lean forward in their seats and they listen very well. We saw the rising generation last night. Yeah. Uh, the youth that were there and 1,500 of them in the stake center, but broadcast to thousands more. And oh, they were they were so powerful, so strong. Uh, so grateful to be in the presence of a prophet. You know, they had their My Family booklets with them. They had their Strength of Youth pamphlets. These are really remarkable uh, young people. 
just after hearing him speak, there's no way that you can negate the things that you believe after hearing someone like him testify of the truth of those things. They are critical to the future. They are pioneers, and they are, have a particular place, I think, in his heart and in his mind. As these young people become parents and grandparents, you can see the pyramid of posterity that will follow. No matter where the country is, what language they speak, or what flag they wave, they become good citizens. We get thanks for their good behavior. Our message is applicable to people of every nation, every kindred, tongue, and it's an invitation to come unto Christ and to let him make life better for you. In the ordinances, the power of God is manifest. Those powerful ordinances are administered in the temple. The purpose of the church is to bring the blessings of God to his children on both sides of the veil. So only in our temples do we receive the highest blessings that God has in store for his faithful children. So how difficult was it to make the decision mm. to close the temples? That was painful. It was racked with worry. Mm. I found myself asking, what would I say to the prophet Joseph Smith? What would I say to Brigham Young, Wilfred Woodruff, and the other presidents on up to President Thomas S. Monson? I'm going to meet him soon. To close the temples would deny all for which all those brethren gave everything. But we really had no other alternative. As a man of science and as a man of faith, the current worldwide pandemic has been of great concern to me. As a man of science, I appreciate the critical need to prevent the spread of infection. As a man of faith, however, I view the current pandemic as only one of many ills that plague our world. But there is no medication or operation that can fix the many spiritual woes and maladies that we face. Even though temples have been closed, family history research and work has taken a huge leap forward. More names are being added. And remarkably, through all of this, the voluntary fast offerings of our members have increased. I've learned that even through clouds of sorrow, there can be silver linings found. We're helping to prepare the world for the second coming. We're also hoping to prepare the people for their second coming home. We wanted to just say, to the people that we love them. We're glad you're members of the church. We're glad you love the Lord. And we just want to be with you.